Hello and welcome to this Forum for Philosophy event at the LSE. My name is Danielle Sands and I'm a fellow at the Forum. I'm going to be chairing this evening's event in which our speakers discuss fantasy. Fantasy is often perceived as an escapist illusion that hinders our engagement with reality, but this overlooks its imaginative potential. How is fantasy structured and what roles does it serve? What can it teach us about ourselves, our relationships, and our constructions of reality? Can fantasy be political? Tonight's discussion will draw on philosophy, art, and psychoanalysis for a reassessment of fantasy. Let me introduce our speakers. Maria Belasca is research fellow in philosophy at the University of Hertfordshire. She is the author of Wittgenstein and Lacan at the Limit, Meaning and Astonishment, published in 2019. And she has recently received a research award for her new book project on the significance of earthly nature for human life and flourishing. Jason Mohage is Associate Professor of Comparative Literature at Babson College. He's interested in emergent currents of experimental thought in the Middle East and the West, and is the author most recently of Omnicide, Mania, Fatality and the Future in Delirium, which was published in 2019. Adam Roberts is Professor of 19th Century Literature at Royal Holloway and author of 12 science fiction novels. His most recent publications include It's the End of the World, But What Are We Really Afraid Of? 2020 and Mount Purgatory, which was published this year. There'll be lots of time for audience questions at the end, so please do post your questions in the chat or on Facebook. So Maria, perhaps you can start things off. What is fantasy? Thank you, Danielle, and hello, uh, Jason and Adam and everyone. So um, tonight we'll explore different aspects of fantasy, but I'd like to start with the role it has for the mental life. And fantasy in that context is traditionally associated with scenarios that are implausible or even impossible in reality. So when you say to someone you're living in a fantasy, that's usually a reproach that means you're cut off from reality, you're not thinking straight. Now, there's definitely an element of escape in fantasy, but I would like to start the discussion by challenging a bit that clear-cut distinction between fantasy and reality. And my way to do that will be to turn to psychoanalysis. Now, Freud defines neurosis in that way. He says that neurosis has as a result and the purpose to force us out of real life. Uh, it is important to note here that when neurotics use fantasy to turn away from reality, they don't lose touch with all reality. That For that, a more appropriate characterization would be psychosis. They lose touch with what we call reality testing. Um, so I want to suggest that in doing so, in this kind of escaping reality testing, neurotics, which basically means most of us, uh, structure reality. Now there's a stronger version and a weaker version of that idea of structuring. Uh, one is to just say that fantasy uh, makes us perceive reality differently. So it's more like a kind of a, a pair of spectacles that you wear and that colors your, your perception. But there's also a stronger version, this is where I wanna go, that says that fantasy actually changes the reality. It kind of transforms it so that it conforms to it. Why am I saying that? Now you may have noticed that I'm talking about fantasy in the singular. Uh, even though there are, of course, in the life of the individual, different fantasies, sexual fantasies, daydreams, daydreaming scenarios. But for psychoanalysis, and especially for Lacan, there's something that binds these different scenarios together. And he calls that a fundamental fantasy, a kind of more primordial and conscious fantasy that provides the setting for what we imagine that the other desires from us or in us. For Lacanian psychoanalysis, that's really, that's a fundamental question. What does the other want from me? Uh, and that's where fantasy comes in. So I will just mention a few uh, fundamental fantasies, like examples to show how, and pick one to show how they can, it can structure reality. And then I will open this to discussion. Um, so we can find different examples of fundamental fantasies in neurotics. Some examples could be, um, the other uh, wants to betray me, I don't trust anyone, or I am guilty, I have to be punished, so the other is going to punish me, 
or I seduce, I'm a seducer. And if we pick that latter example uh, and show how that can lead to a certain structuring of fantasy, I invite you to now imagine a case of a man who always finds himself dating married women. Now, this for psychoanalysis could be a case of structuring reality according to that scenario. Um, and there's obviously a suffering here because this man's object of love can never be fully available to him. But in repeating that choice, the idea is that man is, this man is recreating the fantasy that is so attractive to him, structuring reality in a way that corresponds to this uh, fantasy and using real life people as proxies to play out this kind of uh, fantasy scenario again and again. And what I find particularly interesting in that, and that's my final point, is that when that happens, when fantasy structures reality, fantasy connects to the dimension of fate, of faithfulness. So life appears to be uh, faithful or as uh, some kind of destiny um, where my choices kind of keep getting repeated and I end up with the same things. And that's a connection between fantasy and fate. Thanks, Maria. Can I just ask you a quick question? Where do these fantasies come from? Um, the fundamental fantasy comes from early life experiences for psychoanalysis. So the child kind of asks the question, what, what does the mother want from me? What does the father want from me? And in this kind of chaotic world where it tries to understand what is happening, it creates a scenario. Usually it's also connected to traumatic experiences, but sometimes um, it isn't. It's just a kind of um, normal way into, Lacan will say, into desiring. That's how we learn to desire. That's why that's built up. Thanks. So these early sort of experiences influence the fantasies of, of the adult. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's the idea. Thank you. Um, Jason, I wonder whether you want to jump in there. Sure. You know, what I found so eloquent about what Maria just uh, provided us as, a, as an overture is that fantasy can emerge at all ends of the spectrum of human experience, both in its most vitalistic and catastrophic manifestations. So fantasies can be subversive, mystifying, bizarre, elegant. They can also be cruel, compulsive, and deeply oppressive. Uh, so if we start with just one of a thousand distinctions and subcompartments of fantasy that have been at war with one another since the ancient world, you know, when early nomads first looked at the stars and dreamed up the most elaborate cosmologies, uh, there's a war along the axis of, for lack of better terms, what you could call human imagination versus human neurosis, which is what Maria called it. Um, another way of saying this is a battle between something I studied, delirium or mania, which is the realm of intense, unique, and enlivening moods, or even that will to madness that you sometimes see in the spheres of art, philosophy, mysticism, and certain visionary moments of science, and, uh, versus neurosis, which is the realm of often pathetic, rigid, and desperately violent constructs of identity and society. What I like that Maria did very much in confusing the boundaries is that what we call social reality or political realities are entirely based in fictions and in, and in all kinds. So both of them, the, the part that I'm really intrigued by, kind of the delirium and the neurotic fantasies that become social reality, they, they both invoke, invoke fantastical scenarios or what uh, was sometimes called magical thinking, or even what Freud called the omnipotence of thought, which is just the idea that you believe your mental projections, your ideas, your hallucinations, your wishes, that they can be manifested in reality if you just perform them the right way, or if you repeat them ritualistically enough times, almost like the reading of a spell that line by line increasingly transforms the world that surrounds you. So uh, just as to, to go a little further, again, in this fatal conflict between, say, the brilliant openness of imagination and the totalitarian conf confinements of the psyche, we notice that fantasy arises to play a strange role, either as a source of power, uh, extreme power, or as an awful prison. Uh, originally, fantasy is what allowed our ancestors to first contemplate things that do not exist. It's a basic philosophical principle, but it's immense in its proportions. You know, that includes the ability to even fathom and create gods or to invent new geometries and architectures like the pyramids or those tribal storytellers who envisioned 
monsters and inhuman creatures or spirits that became folklore and culture. And they often didn't resemble human beings or anything that was known. Uh, so in this sense, fantasy becomes the initial confrontation with impossibility itself. What's not there, what can't happen, what's unlike or beyond the real, which is awesome. But then we flash forward and as those sorcerers started becoming institutionalized servants of the pharaohs and kings, and as the political universe increasingly enslaved fantasy to its own figments, you start getting the rise of myths. And that's another genre of fantasy that I think we should talk about because it's the most dangerous one for me. Myths are all about establishing unity and absolute origins. The myth of a nation, people, and ethnicity, which leads to the terrible suffocating history of civilization that has resulted in the tragic killing machines of the past millennia, whether in the name of utopian fantasies, utopia is a fantasy as well, and it's what's at the bottom of religion or race or empire, which we saw explode genocidally in the modern age. I also think the antidote, by the way, to those fantasies is fantasy. So just, again, a different, a different thing. So this fight continues between the creative and destructive faces of fantasy. You know, the beautiful... Uh, delirium of a fantasy like Jorge Luis Borges' great short story, The Library of Babel. I don't know if you guys have read it, but just phenomenal. You know, these mystics wandering the aisles of these infinity zones of books in search of hidden answers and other worldly dimensions. And then you have the narcotizing and murderous fantasies of so-called perfect systems, all the isms that ruled over the 20th century, which continue to plague us as violent delusions. So both partake of fanta fantastical possibilities, speculations, amazing leaps of logic, but one is the proponent of radical originality and enchantment, and the other drags us into pure atrocity. Thanks, Jason. There's an awful lot going on there that I think we'll, we'll come back to. Um, I just want to sort of rewind slightly and, and just um, return to a point that you both made, which is that it seems to be that our assumption that there is a sort of clean distinction between reality and fantasy is mistaken. Um, Adam, is that something that you would agree with? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to come at it, I think, from a slightly different um, perspective, uh, to Maria and Jason. Interesting uh, kind of context for, for what, I, what I'm going to talk about, which is kind of genre fantasy, which is this idea that fantasy has become embedded in a particular literary discourse. So I write science fiction novels. Science fiction is a kind of fantasy um, but I grew up reading Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And when Tolkien and C.S. Lewis write their fantasy novels, they are taking part in, in what is actually, I think, the general mainstream of human storytelling. Not all stories are fantasies. There are realist stories, uh, mimetic stories, Balzac and Zola or Tolstoy and George Eliot telling stories that aim to represent the way the world actually is as we live in it, and it's going for something more documentary, but they are, I think, the exception, not the rule. Most human storytelling is rooted in fantasy. I think for the reasons that Maria and Jason are, are, are outlining, uh, that's what Homer is says. The Odyssey is a fantasy. Beowulf is a fantasy. R medieval romance is a fantasy. The Fairy Queen is a fantasy. Paradise Lost is a fantasy. I mean, my interest is, is, in a sense, quite narrow in that because I grew up reading Tolkien and because I'm now, although I'm old enough to know better, I'm still, I'm kind of, I love Tolkien. Mm -hmm. And there's something about those sorts of stories, fantasy stories and science fiction stories, that compel genuine love in their fans. Um, and I'm interested in why that should be. So I think uh, alongside the, the kind of psychoanalytic perspective that Maria um, so eloquently spelled out, I'd suggest a kind of historical one. What did, let's say, The Lord of the Rings mean to me when I was growing up in a semi-detached house in a London suburb in the 1970s, reading it obsessively over and over? And I think it was simply that desire to escape, to go somewhere that was more beautiful, more elegant, more wondrous, more enchanted than my mundane, ordinary life. And that is what we love. These are the things that make us fall in love with a person or with an idea, as Jason is saying, or with an imaginary world like Middle Earth. Um, and as far as that goes, I think for a while, I, I, I tell myself a particular story uh, um, about the success of fantasy. He's a very strange fellow, J.R.R. Tolkien, in many ways. And he wrote his book because he was fascinated with language and linguistics and he'd made up a number of invented languages and wanted a, an environment in which they could 
because he believed language correctly. I think he believed language doesn't exist in the abstract; it's always embodied in the world. So he made a world in which his languages could be spoken. Very kind of niche interest. And he published those novels. He published The Hobbit in 1937. Um, and he published Lord of the Rings, 1954 to 55, in three volumes. And at the time, they were small scale successes. And then from the 1960s onwards, they became increasingly enormous, un unavoidable global phenomena. And then Amazon uh, are now spending more money than has ever been spent on a TV production, making a huge multi episode TV adaptation of Tolkien's fantasy. There's something about this fantasy. Despite the fact that it comes out of a very peculiar, kind of idiosyncratic and very English sensibility that appeals to a global audience. And I'm really interested in what that is. So I think I'd, I'd, I'd say I'll make two points. I don't want to kind of hog the, the camera. One is that the, the way to perhaps frame, let's say, my love for Middle Earth when I was a 12 year old reading it over and over is that I was growing up in a disenchanted world. A disenchantment is a, a, a word particularly associated with the German sociologist Max Weber, who uh, is a historian and sociologist, and he studied the ways in which the world has changed from, let's say, the medieval time and earlier to modernity. It's become more secular. It's become more rational. It's become less religious. Uh, it's not that people aren't religious nowadays, but they're, it's possible not to be religious nowadays when it wasn't possible in medieval Europe not to be religious you know, everyone went to church you had no choice in the matter but the sense of what the world is like has changed and Weber I mean Weber's writing 100 years ago more recently the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor published a, 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 a very interesting book very very long book I have to say uh, a secular age in which he says how did this change come about how did it go from when it from a situation where it wasn't possible not to believe in God, everyone believed in God, to a situation where it's perfectly okay. Now we can say, I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist, that's all right. How have we gone from uh, the, the old religious world to this modern secular world? And Taylor traces what is a kind of Weberian, a kind of Max Weber narrative that we have become disenchanted. The way that Taylor says is that in, in prehistory and in early history, in the times of the Greeks and the Romans, in the medieval Europe, uh, our sensibilities were porous. That's the word he uses. It's like a sponge. And things that, that were out there, that we thought were out there, penetrated us. There were ghosts in the world. There were angels in the world. And they interacted with people, or gods and monsters. Um, and that was kind of wondrous and, and beautiful, but also alarming and scary, because perhaps there were demons in the world that would possess you and take you over that what we've done is we've swapped that porous sensibility for what Taylor calls a buffered sensibility. We've put a layer between ourselves, our subjectivities, our minds, and the world out there, so that we're no longer scared, most of us, that we're going to be possessed by a demon, that we live in a rational, regular world, a secular world. And that has advantages, um, particularly material advantages in terms of the kinds of lives we can lead and the securities we can uh, hold on to, but it means that we have lost something, that the world is not as it used to be. It's not enchanted in the way it was. So I suppose this is an argument It's made by um, the American scholar Alan Jacobs. Uh, he says that's what fantasy as a genre is doing for us nowadays. It is supplying a need. Many people feel it's the world being disenchanted in the way that secularity means that it is disenchanted it means you miss something, you lack something. Fantasy, by creating these worlds which are defined not by the iron logic of Newtonian science, but by magic and wonder, and it's full of beautiful creatures like unicorns and elves, as well as you know, horrifying, scary creatures like trolls and orcs and all the paraphernalia of it. We're getting a kind of safer version of that porous sensibility that used to be the default before we entered into the logic of modernity. And I'm kind of persuaded by that. I can see the, the appeal of that as an explanation of why fantasy is so huge. Why when Peter Jackson directs The Lord of the Rings as a trilogy of movies, they become the highest grossing movies of all time. People flock to see them, that that's what's being supplied. They're, they're kind of rather pre-Raphaelite elegance, the medieval enchantment 
of Tolkien's realm fills a need in us. But that leads me to another question, and this is what I'll finish on. Um, since I was, I was reading C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien in the 1970s, and I've carried on reading genre fantasy, and I love all that stuff, uh, even though I am, as I say, old enough to know better, one of the things that I've noticed to fantasy as a literary genre over the last half century is that it has got a lot nastier. It's now very dark and violent. Um, that it happened in stages, I think. Michael Moorcock's um, Elric or Mel Nibonet books are kind of cynical and violent and knowing, but they're also kind of elegant in a fantasy echler sort of way. Whereas George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, which was made into the TV Game of Thrones, is just a torture fest. It's just people being horrible to one another in great detail. And I wonder what the appeal there is. That's not about enchantment. No rational person would want to go and live in Westeros, where life is absolutely nasty, brutish and short. And the best explanation I can come up with that, which I'm not very satisfied with, and I don't think, I'm not sure it's right, is that this is speaks to fantasy in the sense that Jason and Maria were talking about fantasy. Um, one of the, I think, one of the most persuasive things that Freud ever wrote was his Civilization and its Discontents book. I held off from reading that book for a long time because I'd heard about it and I was gearing myself up. And actually, it's really short and really quite easy to understand. I wish I got to it sooner. In which Freud says, civilization, living in a civilized society, brings all sorts of benefits. But at the same time, it entails necessary discontents. There's no getting away from that because you have to compromise your needs have to, to come to some arrangement with the needs of others. That that the way we are when we are toddlers, when you're angry, you shout and you hit. When you want something, you grab it. When you grow up into civilization, Freud says, you have to stop doing that. If you want this beautiful woman, you can't just grab her. If you're angry with this with your boss, you can't just stab him in the chest. You learn, Freud said, you, you can't make those feelings, those urges magically dissipate. They're still there. What you can do is you can repress them. That's the mechanism we have. So we end up repressing our, our desires and our you know, hatreds and our anxieties. And the greatest thing that Freud ever said, which I think is a profound truth, is that the repressed always returns. It returns in all sorts of strange and often fantastical shapes. I wonder if Westeros is an environment where you're allowed to do these things. If you, if you hate someone, chop their head off with a sword. Go ahead, everyone's doing it. That's the kind of fantasy space that that world creates. I don't know what, I mean, I'm, Maria, I'm sure knows much more about Freud than I do. I'm just thinking, um, based on, on, on what uh, you, Adam, and, and Jason has said that we've we've already kind of mapped um, two different ways in which fantasy um, is central. And I'm also thinking of a third, even more kind of basic way that might be helpful for, for our audience too. So we've already said how fantasy connects to the psychic reality, right? And it kind of, it, it, it's important for, for the development of the psyche and for the, the continuation of, of the psychic life. Um, so that, well, that's what I connected to, to desire. Then there is the really important topic that I'm sure we're going to go back to of disenchantment and the particular historical uh, time of like modernity and what happens there. I'm, I'm very interested in that. But I think there's even a more basic kind of um, philosophical perhaps uh, distinction to be drawn and connection between fantasy and imagination imagination that Jason mentioned um, because very much imagination is 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 a faculty a kind of cognitive um, way for concept formation right we need imagination in order to even to even form concepts so in that sense um, a type of or perhaps um, something to which fantasy belongs because I don't know how you think about it, but I imagine that imagination is this kind of um, type and then fantasy is a, is a token, is a, um, a, a particular, that um, imagination is, is a way in which we enter, through which we enter into reality, we get access to reality. So we have these kind of three paths so far, don't we? Fantasy and imagination, fantasy and the psychic, uh, 
uh, life, the mental life, and then fantasy as a, as a particular, as a genre, and something that kind of comes up more specifically, historically, with, with modernity. I don't know if that... If yeah, that's, I, that's right, isn't it? But it's also to, to kind of to tag Jason, if you like, because there is another... I'm not, I'm not trying to overcomplicate things. It is really fascinating. Fantasy is also about history. So one of my... One of my pet theories about Tolkien and the reason why Tolkien became as successful as he did as a writer of fantasy is that he was doing in his kind of idiosyncratic English personal fantasy stories, doing something quite similar to what Wagner was doing in his great operas in the late 19th century. It's still stories about magic and about a magic ring and about dwarfs and dragons and all the things that I mean, Tolkien was very particular. He said, I, I drew nothing from Wagner. They're completely different stories, but you can see, see the kind of family resemblance, but there's a difference. The difference is that Wagner's stories are about Germany and they're about this mythical, ideological construction of Germany as a place of heroes and, and a particular sort of struggle. And Tolkien is not about anywhere. It's about a made up world. So after, I mean, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that these big genre fantasy books become as successful as they do around the time of World War II. One of the things that happened with World War II is that a lot of Wagner's cultural currency was drained away because he was associated with Nazism. So a distinction, another way of putting it would be to say, this is a slightly kind of rough and ready distinction. Science fiction is a kind of fantasy about the future. Not all science fiction novels are set in the future. There's lots of different kinds of science fiction, but that's kind of what it is in which what the, the thing that in fantasy is supplied by magic is supplied by futuristic technologies, whereas fantasy as a genre is kind of about the past. And I'm, I was really struck by what Jason was saying about how, and to use the word again, how ideological these sorts of fantasy myths are. And they, you know, they have direct effects in the world, wouldn't you say, Jason? Absolutely. Well, I, you know, I, I love what everyone's saying here. Adam, when you ask the fundamental question, which I like because... It has all the air of innocence of like, why do you want to, to go into these other worlds and all that? Uh, it makes me think of, of perfect standoff between the typologies of fantasy that we're uh, the, the enchanting ones and then the kind of rabid sadistical ones that you are sort of uh, been outlining, which is which are more and more frequent and increasing. If you take a uh, thousand and one nights, the Arabian tales, you have a psychotic king character who's almost demonically possessed to kill women. He's, mut he's mutilating and killing all his wives every night. And then he meets this cunning, brilliant uh, storyteller, a woman named Shahrzad, Shahrzad in the English sort of. And she tells him these cliffhanger fantasy tales that postpone and delay her, her inevitable doom sort of until she can find a way to elude, dodge, but ultimately counteract his brutal psychology or his brutal consciousness. And uh, those drives, it's interesting to me because this takes us back to the question of desire and how fantasy holds, and Maria started saying as well, a very complex relationship to desire that some types expand and some strangle our impulses depending on their orchestration. So just to say very quickly, you know, with the negative version, and then we'll go to the positive, fantasy can sometimes become inextricably tied to the foremost devastating pitfalls of human psychology. Psychoanalysis tells us one, that we fundamentally do not understand what we actually desire, you know, that we constantly lie to ourselves uh, about what we really want. We conceal death wishes in sublime shapes and vice versa. So our fantasies are often misdirected and misleading as inaccurate regards. Um, the second, and if you want to consider the most wretched uh, version of this, an example of this, where certain actions, fantastical actions are really just substitutes that conceal other suppressed desires. You can look at the fact that uh, serial killers are known for extreme fantasy, that cold, methodical, psychotic brutality that imagines scenarios and ornate situations that are actually anxious repressions masquerading as pleasure. There is no pleasure in sadism. There's just you know, extreme anxiety. But the second thing that psychoanalysis teaches us or philosophy teaches us about desires confirms that people often desire what they don't possess. That's something you were saying, Adam, but that's a brilliant thing, observation, but it also is problematic because it ties us to lack and absence, as you were saying, as you were saying, as you were saying, like those wanderers who are dying of thirst in the desert and they start to see false mirages right at the moment before they die. Uh, and this typically leads to constructing fantasies that will fill the void 
or even cover up the radical meaninglessness of existence by providing false meaning. And that's where fantasy for me becomes potentially dangerous when it becomes allied with meaning, um, you know, and particularly moral meanings and stuff. Third, we learned that, uh, especially from Lacan, Maria knows far better than myself, the more separate and impossible an object, the more that our desire often gets geared towards it. So that's uh, sort of the desire for the far away, for the remotely distant, which again is problematic because that explains the temptation towards utopian ideologies and religions and metaphysics that created all kinds of havoc throughout history. And lastly, fantasy can become dangerous when it's tied to idealization. So when they become perfect worlds or a search for the pure or the ultimate. Um, and that's Mary Shelley's talk about fantasy, brilliant warning, you know, in Frankenstein, talk about modernity as well. It's what it teaches us, which is that when we search for the perfect or the ultimate, this mad doctor who wants to create this idealized creature in his laboratory, often it turns into a monster that will set fire to the entire city and mutilate everything in its wake. So these are the four traps of desire. We don't comprehend our own true object of desire, that we desire what we don't have, which can link fantasy to resentment and envy uh, a lot of the time, um, that we desire what is impossibly distant from ourselves, which makes fantasy a kind of pain often, um, and that we exploit fantasy as a false idealization. Uh, that makes us increasingly despise the actual world, which by the way, just to say quickly, capitalism in our modern age of accelerated technology manipulates this tendency with sick expertise. You know, it simulates an era of artificial pleasure principles, neurotic consumption routines, where fantasy actually becomes uh, embodied in the form of cheap commodities, objects, devices, or spectacles, you know, for, for consumption. The result of this perpetual excess of false desires is that you can buy and sell fantasies like prosthetic souls, but they're almost always an anti-climax. And that's what we're getting to, disenchantment, dissatisfaction, and alienation, or a disappointment, which makes you want to then go escape those failed realities into the pseudo-fantasies of the virtual world. And virtuality is another domain of fantasy we could get into. But just quickly, because I don't want to be the doomsday figure in the conversation, we usually love to be ecstatic and affirmative. There is a radical antidote or countercurrent, and that's the child's imagination to me. Or even certain forms of insanity without uh, romanticizing them. Deleuze the and Guattari looked into that very brilliantly, uh, which break out of the prison house of desire. So let's say the radical alternative to those four failed prototypes of desire that I just brought up, which plague us is the child's exercise of pretending, you know, and because pretending is actually an essential gesture of fantasy where you have to incarnate the transfiguration. You actually have to become a queen or a wolf in your own body, your movements, your sensations, your speech. It's less abstract and symbolic and textual. Um, and so, and the other thing too, is that fantasy in you look at Blade Runner and you look at, you know, sort of futuristic sci-fi, and Adam can speak to this much better. Uh, fantasy is often, in, in our vision, uh, a competitive matrix, you know, where people are in these cutthroat transactional universes, you know, the, the bad part of the city in Blade Runner or, or, or something like that, where you can have all these desires met, but, you know, it's, it's really competitive and, and kind of grotesque. The child's form of play is a much more collaborative and conspiratorial arena of curiosity and role playing where everyone can entertain themselves. And that's kind of more like the ancient customs of the masquerade or the festival. And that's an alternative moment of lived fantasy. So if we compare bad adult psychological fantasies, fame, wealth, recognition, immortality, to fairy tales, one of my favorite genres again, which is this wondrous genre of the child's imagination, you see that fairy tales are not about these internal struggles for who am I, or what do I have, or where do I belong? They're precisely about letting go of oneself, abandoning one's home, traveling off, not to a transcendent place or a digital simulation, but to the forest, the rabbit hole, the attic, the trap door, the labyrinth, that'll dra drastically dismantle the self, not fortify the self. You know, the dangerous other side of the Cartesian, I think, therefore I am, is I fantasize, therefore I am. That also can be part of the conspiracy of building subjectivities that are really uh, hard to disassemble. So the fairy tale for me, I'll just end on this, it shatters these poor foundational assumptions of the self. It leaves you in states of vulnerability, disorientation, bewilderment, which I like, 
As an example, remember Alice's first test in Wonderland is to become bigger and smaller by ingesting the mushroom, which means she has to lose her proportional sense of her being in the world. Then she encounters the Mad Hatter, who ruins all of her assumptions of logic and reason with his crazy choreographies and musical chairs dancing. Then she meets the Cheshire Cat with his malevolent smile, who disabuses her of the easy dialectics of good and evil or cruelty and innocence. Uh, through which, by the way, most political fantasies are born, the, the thought of the, the fantasy of the enemy or the foreigner. But actually in the fairy tale, you have to become the consummate foreigner, the exile, the stranger. You're lured to the outside where you'll be abducted, shapeshifted, soul stolen. So by the time Alice reaches the opium smoking caterpillar uh, and he asks the simple question, who are you? She stutters and flails in language uh, and net recognizes the necessity of having to build an entirely new cosmos of desire and fantasy in order to continue her journey. So that to me is the kind of like those mad prophets who chased invisible voices into the mountains. Uh, it gets away from it. that to me is that radical strangest to me is the most powerful and the most intriguing antidote to the negative versions of fantasy that uh, we were bringing up a little bit as well. Thanks, Jason. Can I just give a reminder to our audience that they can put their questions in the chat box or um, post them on Facebook? I mean, I'm interested in what you're saying about, um, you know, these problematic versions of fantasy, Jason, and they all seem to be tied in some way either to excessive abstraction or to a sort of lack of dialogue or lack of collaboration. Um, and, and you're posing the sort of alternative, the more positive version of, of fantasy as, as something more embodied, if you like, something which is more in touch with embodied existence. I mean, I just, just want to open this up to, to Maria and Adam. Is this kind of account of, of the problems of fantasy, is it being you know, insufficiently collaborative, too abstract? Does that kind of ring true with, with your accounts of fantasy as well? From my point of view, I, I don't see fantasy as I, I, neither good or bad. Um, it is what it is. And then it depends on what kind of uh, uses we we make. And at least in psychoanalysis, like well, the thing I talked about, the, this unconscious fantasy that structures our, that may structure our life and choices, it is more a question of being aware of what's happening and, and being aware of it or, or knowing what kind of, what kind of fantasy guides me um, can can actually um, turn this into something powerful and good because that's that is the way in which we invest uh, and understand kind of deepen our relation to to the world. That's why I think it's so important that we've we've all kind of mentioned this concept of disenchantment um, that comes with. Uh, more political um, dimensions um, of how socially, politically, historically, uh, there may be a different relation to, to the world, one that treats it in a more dominating way. So perhaps fantasy, the problem with fantasy in those cases is that it serves a very dominating, as Adorno puts it, attitude towards nature, the earth, that's something that interests me, other entities. Um, yeah, so that's that would be my short answer to that. So I think that, that's clearly a problem with science fiction, and I love science fiction, I write science fiction, but that idea, that kind of Adorno idea that science fiction sees everything as a technological resource to be exploited and sold. I suppose a fantasy fan would say fantasy is about being you know, in harmony with the natural world. It's something... But fashion. do you agree with that? Do you think that science fiction no, does that? I don't. Yeah. I do obviously, I don't. I don't write it. Does it, or 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 none? It never does it. Do you think it potentially does it? Like, well, some, oh no, some, of course, yeah, sometimes it does it. Of course, it does. And sometimes there are tech tech bros we could call them who who think that that this is you know everything is a technological problem to be solved. And I do think there are much as I love fantasy and I continue to read it. I do think there are genuine historicized problems in it. It's very racial, let's say. It's certainly true of Wagner, who was a profoundly anti-Semitic individual, but it's true of Tolkien that his his elves are very Aryan and, and blonde and blue-eyed and his orcs are very dark-skinned and his view of the world was was that of a kind of 
a small C conservative, large C conservative, actually, English man in the middle of the 20th century. That once this becomes, well, as Jason was saying, once this kind of acquires the patina of myth, on the one hand, you then have a kind of plausible deniability and you say, I'm not racist. I don't hate black people. These aren't black people. They are orcs, which is kind of fools no one. On the other hand, it then becomes harder to address because it is baked into the, the way that the world is, is built. I mean, I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to think that Jason is right, that there is at the heart of the appeal of fantasy is something childlike in a positive sense. So G.K. Chesterton, who is the kind of closest that you get to Jacques Lacan 100 years ago, he said of fantasy, um, the, the important thing about fantasy is not that it tells us that dragons exist. The important thing about fantasy is that it tells us that dragons can be defeated. And I think if I had to make a kind of construct a defense, if you like, of Tolkien for all his problems, or all the kind of problematic aspect of his fantasy, it's that his overarching story. I mean, I keep going back to Tolkien, I think just because I, I assume he's, he's very well known, he's very famous and so on, but his overarching story is not one of triumph, it's of repudiation. His story is a quest, but it's not a quest to find treasure and bring it home and be rich. It's not a kind of colonialist or imperialist quest. His quest is to take treasure and throw it away. That the ring of power, which is the most, you know, this golden ring, which has this ability to rule the world, has to be let go. And there's something kind of psychologically profound in that, in understanding that the, the path to contentment is not in the accumulation of all these kind of objets pétés. It is in getting rid of the thing that is obsessing you, the thing which is bending your life around its lines of force because it's about desire and about repetition and also actually interestingly about invisibility. And I think there's something kind of wise in that actually, in that larger narrative arc. Absolutely. I, I would say, you know, Danielle asked a, a wonderful question when she brought up the concept of abstraction. Is abstraction a problem? Not at all to me. You know, metaphysics can be problematic. All sorts of things can be problematic when they're abstract, but not all abstractions are problematic. I love mirages and hallucinations and dreams and unrealities of all kinds and images and all of that. These are, these are very powerful. Without that, I mean, life becomes truly totalitarian, you know. Uh, but the, the, the question is, you know, a good example, and I wonder what, you'd all have to bring an obscure one to kind of go alongside as a companion to Tolkien. There was a, I'm in Southern Spain right now, about an hour from where I'm back, you know, a thousand years ago, there was a great Arab philosopher named uh, Ibn Tufail. And Ibn Tufail had a weird story he told. He was an Aristotelian, which is not my favorite creature in the world, but it is a great question by Aristotle. He said, if we could imagine, this is the story he tells, if we could imagine there's a, a young boy who at birth, Typical paranoid father king, he's uh, thrown away to try and die. They put him on an island because he's paranoid that he's going to take over the throne. And he miraculously survives on the island. But with zero human contact, zero trace of human civilization or society or any of that. The question that Aristotle asks, that Ibn Tufel answers, is would we envision that as that child grows up uh, increasingly, that they would be simply reduced to the most vulgar kind of barbaric level of the animal? Would they just go on pure instinct and eat and feed and sleep, you know, uh, and do all these sort of bodily things? Or would there be a capacity for abstract imaginative thought that would emerge? Would he develop a language? Would he develop concepts of God? And actually he takes it to the extreme limit where he says, oh, you better believe it. And you better believe that the images that he'll construct, so he takes them to a cave, this, this, uh, his name's Hay, Hay Ibn Yazan. This young boy ends up in a cave, just constructing the most elaborate, crazy diagrams of the universe, that you, numerologies and God typologies and all that, that you could ever, he becomes the most brilliant storyteller in existence, essentially. And fancy, spends all his time meditating and fantasizing about these possibilities and all that. So he's not this pure, brutish kind of, kind of figure. Now, it's interesting that when he's contacted finally by human civilization, they realize that their fantasies or their ideas of society, their myths, pale in comparison in terms of the complexity, the intensity, the aesthetics, and the philosophical intricacy of the ones that he was able to invent in his pure solitude. 
And the, the essence of it for me is actually something that Deleuze said brilliantly about abstraction. Deleuze, for all his becomings and his becoming stone, becoming molecule, becoming this and that and that, he loved abstraction, but he had a different definition. He said the bad type of abstraction, which he saw in Hegel and other figures, is abstraction that was discrete and discrete, with C-R-E-E-T and E-T-E. Discrete, meaning that it separates things, like into taxonomies and hierarchies, and it stratifies existence. That type of abstraction is bad. There's the, the angels, and then the this, and the prophets, and then the priests, and then that's when you get that. And he said, and discrete as in hidden or concealed. He said, when it becomes that, it becomes terrible abstraction. But as long as abstraction are these visionary explosions of, of possible experience and sensation and affect and mood and impulse, they're wonders. As long as they're not about separating, carving distinctions and boundaries, and as long as they're not about uh, you know, the thing that is hidden behind the surface and all of that, you know, that's the beautiful thing again about the fairy tale. What does the Mad Hatter mean in any deeper psychological system? Nothing. He's crazy. That's it. Mercury poisoning to the head. There's no great metaphoric, symbolic, psychological analysis that you have to do of any of the characters in Wonderland. Deleuze says this beautifully. It's surfaces. Now, that doesn't mean there's not infinite complexity at the surface. You can write dissertations on the Mad Hatter's movements, his, his affects, his color schemes, his use of tone, all sorts of, but you don't need to say, what does it really mean? You know, what is it hiding? It hides nothing. Uh, that, that translucent quality is the type of abstraction that I like a lot. And by the way, interestingly, horror can sometimes do that quite brilliantly. It's another genre of we don't talk about much, but uh, the monster, which is pure nightmare in the sense of this can't be happening, but it's happening. The nightmare is the experience of something which is too real, impossible, but too real. Uh, and, some, and they often abandon the need for a sort of massive over-psychologization of the creature because they're just an automatic thing that is walking towards you. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But it's interesting, isn't it? Which of these sorts of myths speak to us? Because that's really fascinating. I didn't, I hadn't, I've not heard that story before, Jason. Um, and I should, I should be more knowledgeable about my Arab philosophy than I am, evidently. But I, I suppose I'd submit the version of that, I mean, a version of that story that has had the greatest impact in the modern West is William Golding's Lord of the Flies. And that tells a very different story, doesn't it? That says if you take away the hierarchies of society and just leave these kids on an island, they will turn into beasts. Mm -hmm. And that was, I mean, that was Golding before World War II. I mean, I, I keep coming back to World War II because it does seem to me that there's something to do with that the collective trauma and the Holocaust and everything that went on there that marks fantasy with the capital F in a genre, but also in a larger sense. Before the war, Golding was a, a young school teacher and he believed in the perfectibility of mankind. He said, if only we can teach the children and uh, encourage them. And then he went and served in the war and he came out the other end completely changed. And the way he put it was, um, anyone who lived through those years and didn't understand that man makes evil as a bee honey must have been not right in the head. And that was the, the moral he took away from World War II. We make evil in the way that bees make honey. And all his fiction that he wrote after the war says that. That's his myth. That's his kind of fantasy. It's not a very comforting fantasy, but it's one that has spoken really, really widely. So I don't know how we are we in a place now where we can't connect with the story you were telling or retelling, Jason, that if we could just get away from all these other you know, social distractions and pressures and oppressions, we would break through like William Blake and see some you know, eternity in a grain of sand. Or are we too mired in that sense? I, mean, well, I, I, won't, could... I, I won't, I won't answer, you know, to, 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 to answer such a powerful question, but I, I would say one thing, which is that I trust someone who, you know, also is in the same time period as Tolkien, and who is writing a form of fantasy, and he's an, a borderline god to me, is Kafka. You know, and, and Kafka, I mean, you can see the Kafka-esque as a you know, quasi-fantastical three steps to the left of reality. It's a slight, you know, it's not as flagrant as surrealism, you know, uh, or it's not as, uh, 
uh, otherworldly or supernatural as some genres. But nevertheless, I mean, it's weird and it's off a little bit and it's abnormal. And the Kafka's creativity, you know, everyone thinks he was this mousy, introverted figure. He was aware that he was one of the greatest writers ever to walk the planet. He was very aware of that fact. Uh, at the same time, didn't want his work to be read, as you all know. But one of the things that he claimed was the wellspring of his originality and his kind of fantasies was idleness. And if you even read Michel de Montaigne, one of the founding figures of the essay, he's a low-level aristocrat who's just rich enough that he has servants and doesn't have to clean his own castle, but he's not important enough that he has to go into any important meetings or be consulted by any kings. So he wanders around his castle all day in a state of idleness and he decides to invent the essay, more or less, and just basically it's on whim. And the one of the first essays I'm sure you all know is, is on cannibals. It's a very exotic meditation on places he's never been to. And he, and he ends up, what I love about it, and I don't mind that you know, he does, is that he sides with the cannibals. He finds himself like liking them in the end more than he likes his French compatriots and their systems of justice. So idleness, if that is part of what maybe leads to creativity uh, in a way, which is a kind of active nihilism, like why the heck not? I'll come up with a fantasy for today to, to kill time while time's killing me. If that's the essence of Kafka, and Kafka used to brag that he's the laziest person in existence, and, he, and he's also groundbreaking beyond belief. Yes, I think our contemporary moment with the uh, you know obsessive, technological, being linked in, being on screens, being hooked into the world, doesn't give us these pockets of idleness that we can carve out, these momentary solitudes as easily uh, as it used to be, especially because we're being conditioned, and Maria can speak to this much better than me, we're being conditioned to think that every fantasy to some extent also can have an interior quality, like the writing of diaries and private, has an element of secrecy to it as well. You know, the imagination can be interior. Uh, and we're being conditioned increasingly to spill and purge every single thought, impulse, experience onto Twitter, onto wherever, you know, and to report ourselves, which, by the way, is the true dream of totalitarianism. Not that there's Big Brother watching you with a camera somewhere, but that you yourself are self-reporting and incapable of conspiracy, incapable of a private world or an underground or a revolutionary or forbidden idea or image. You're just constantly on the external. And that is, by the way, the fundamental definition of schizophrenia, the inability to have an interior world, the necessity to project every thought, every speech act, every idea outwards. Uh, it's one of the now, definitions, many definitions. Yeah, and that, 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 that speaks to me, if I think back to my 12 year old sense, the reading Tolkien was an intensely private business. I'd sit in my bedroom and I'd read this book and I would be taken out of it. I'm reminded that George Steiner says about how when he was studying Kafka, he was reading Kafka's letters, and something struck him as being odd about Kafka's letters, which is that when Kafka signed his name at the end of the letter, he signed his name and put a full stop after, at the end of it. No one does that. When you sign your name at the bottom of the letter, you don't put a full stop at the end of it. <laughs> Kafka did. And there's a kind of downside to that, which is that, you know, he's, he's sealed away. He's living this deracinated hermetic existence. But I think you're right. There's a positive side as well, isn't there? He's protecting his own... You know, his own space. He's that's the disc, the kind of good side of the discrete thing you were talking about earlier. Yeah. What do you think, Maria? I don't know. I think we are we are kind of struggling with the question. Um, we're still struggling with the question: when is fantasy, um, when is fantasy helpful, and when is it unhelpful? And it seems to me, I mean, again, the way I understand. Um, the way one way to understand fantasy historically is to see it as a as a reaction to a um, a kind of um, technological what 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 sometimes people call the techno scene right a kind of technological scientific view of the world that demythologizes disenchants the world completely and where um, entities are just treated as um, what Heidegger calls standing reserve, right? As stock, as something to be just exploited and used for our needs. So one could say that that fantasy is a way to reanimate the world, right? I, um, I, we haven't talked about animes and, and I don't, uh, I, I really, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of animes and especially of, of Miyazaki. 
And what Miyazaki does does for me in his films is exactly to bring back a dimension of reality that in this more technological, uh, scientific, disenchanted world is not there. So one could say that even doing that, just reimagining the world um, as something animated, um, that that is very, very precious. Is that is that something we would agree on, or or is that not enough? And we think it should kind of lead to action, to a kind of action that would help reclaim our world back from kind of capitalistic, um, technocratic way of of being. Maria, if I could say this quickly, just because I think yeah. you actually led us to something that might astound some of our watchers and listeners that I love to report as someone who teaches non-Western literatures from East Asian to Latin American, Middle Eastern, you know, that in some of the most violent regions, African as well, uh, if you look at contemporary Middle Eastern literature in the midst of countries that are burning, you know, absolutely burning, some of the most ancient civilizations on earth, the most ancient, Syria, Iraq, Libya, uh, on fire, these places, in some of the worst genocidal circumstances. Their poets, not the ones that are translated into English or writing in English, you know, uh, in the US and, and England and other places and winning awards, but the actual Arab, North African, Iranian, uh, Afghani, Armenian poets in the region that are writing, uh, they are more fantastical than ever before. They're more surrealistic than ever before. And no one mistakes this as a pathetic escapism or a false transcendence. They crave that. Because I always say, going to an Iraqi mother, writing a social realist, pedantic, uh, propagandistic poem about uh, people being killed in the street is obscene. She does not need that enlightenment. The West parasitically and voyeuristically loves to false, have these exercises of false pity and talk about child soldiers in Africa and about you know, the, the people who are victimized this way. That's, I hate to put it, but that's part of the spectacle uh, that allows precisely a kind of fantastic, bad fantasy, charade more or facade more to conceal the fact that that violence is absolutely necessary to their sustained existence. But... Uh, and so these self-righteous sort of false empathies and all of that. But on that side, go read Hassan Blasim, the greatest Iraqi short story writer, the greatest writer of today. Go read uh, Joyce Mansour, a great Egyptian surrealist who, you know, one of my absolute favorites, who was writing in a time of devastation in North Africa and anti-colonialism. They are the most insane, absurd surrealists. Go read Mahmoud Darwish the most epic Palestinian poet of all time, when he says things like, and I saw the suns and moons kneel before me and the winds bow before my feet. He's not talking about bombs and bullets in the most explicit, flagrant social, that would be too easy and his people would reject it as lacking in creativity. They want something incendiary, visionary, otherworldly. That is the, uh, what they crave more than anything. Uh, and they don't see it as a cheap way out or an excuse. How can you be living in the Palestinian territories and ignore the violence? They assume if you're there and you're writing like, well, you get it, you're in it. So you don't need to prove your credentials, your progressive credentials by over-politicizing. In fact, over-politicized uh, literature is the least, look at 20s in South America, I'll just say this, magical realism was the genre that arose in, in Latin America and South America and the Caribbean in the 20th century in the midst of all kinds of colonial civil wars, occupations, totalitarian interludes. Who's arising in, in uh, Argentina? Griselda Gambaro, uh, you know, uh, Borges, these other figures, Cortazar, brilliantly fantastical writers. And the people get it, that it carries all the implications of a critique as well, but it's also a creative creative counterbalance. I feel like you're giving us the, uh, the roots of another event here, Jason. Oh, God help. God help. Um, Be careful what you open... wish for, remember? <laughs> uh, um, I can see we've got a few questions from the audience, and there's one that sort of uh, links on from, from what you've been saying. So this is a question from Chris about whether there can be a positive project concerning the initial state of the motivated reader or fantasizer. So here I mean, must we always frame at least motivated engagement with literary fantasy as an escapist tendency, implying rejection of and lack inherent in the real, rather than as a po positive motivation for engaging a particular type of adventurous project, 
of the same kinds available in reality. No, absolutely. And that follows on from what Jason was saying. These are, this is the default mode of human storytelling. This is how humans have mostly told stories going right the way back to the epic of Gilgamesh. And I think there's a reason for that, which follows on from Jason's point. Um, this is not original to me. This is Samuel Delaney, the American science fiction writer, says this. Well, he was asked why he wrote science fiction. He says, I love science fiction because it is a metaphorical literature. It's a metaphorical literature because it aims to represent the world without reproducing it. And metaphors are more eloquent than documentaries. Metaphors are poetry. Metaphors are expressive. And Jason's absolutely right. We don't need to have reality reproduced for us because we live in reality. I mean, I'm not entirely dismissing you know, realism and that whole tradition. I do think there's an argument, which is probably too complicated to get into here, that connects le naturalisme, realism, 19th century Zola and Tolstoy and so on, with a particular Enlightenment project, which aims to do what Maria was saying, which is to treat the world as a huge heap of facts that can be mastered and assembled. Whereas metaphor leaps over that. Metaphor, as Paul Ricoeur says in his book on metaphor, is alive in a way that realism isn't and that's the great i mean that's, i mean that's it's kind of special pleading that's why i write science fiction because it's a metaphorical literature and because i'm interested in representing the world without reproducing it i mean there's a whole big question now about the extent to which philosophy can engage with the fantastical or what language philosophy would have to take up in order to do that um well nature nature's quite a fantasy right isn't it yes he is I, we've got so many questions from the audience, I'm going to move to one of those. So this is from Anna. I like Maria's reference of reanimating or reimagining the world. Fantasy tends to have uh, negative connotations perhaps to some, but as someone who studied drama and theology, I find that people find this, feel the setting of theatre or cinema better and safer to explore difficult issues in than within real life. So if you present someone with a story in the pretend setting of a stage, they seem better able to develop understanding or see a complex situation for what it is. Can fantasy be more useful than we give it credit for in being a tool of empathy? Um, yes, is the short answer. Um, I mean, um, Anna is right that, um, and we didn't, we didn't, exp I mean, we didn't have the time to explore all that, but um, that is, that I think that's what Jason was referring to when he was talking about children and, and play, that, that that's precisely what fantasy and imagination allows for, a kind of safe space where I can identify with others and play the role of others and kind of um, understand my situation from the other's perspective. Um, and I think this is also what... Um, well, paradoxically, I think this is also what allows this fundamental fantasy that I spoke about in the beginning to be um, um, to, to be worked through in an analysis that uh, the analyst kind of takes on this, these other roles of these kind of parental figures, uh, these early early figures that have, um, plays as an important role in the structuring of the unconscious fantasy. So, so yes, theater, um, books, di different ways in which fantasy is, is being put to use are ways of identifying with other figures and therefore understanding more deeply reality. But presumably there's a tension there with between the tendency to project onto that other and the capacity for actual kind of empathetic engagement? Mm. Well, what is the difference? Because um, if, if what you're doing is playing these different roles and, and you, then your reason to do that, the, the, the reason why you're doing that is precisely because somehow you are aware of the projection. That's what you're trying to work through. Um, so in, in, in the scenario, who the, uh, the man who always finds married women, um, he, well, he, he kind of projects that that's, that's his problem. While, um, I think in the scenario that Anna is describing, we kind of, um, 
put ourselves in the shoes of others to work through the projection. So there's a sort of reflexivity sort of inherent in it. Yeah, exactly. You know, th- can I say something just quickly to that? Because Maria right, made right. me think of something, which is, you know, we, we, we I, I know there are questions. We haven't talked about sort of the role of fascination. Uh, and, and, and of course, Maria can talk about astonishment quite brilliantly, you know, and, and, and those theories of that. But, you know, just to me- mention very quickly, when we talk about empathy, empathy doesn't need to be uh, so deeply or profoundly existential in the, in, again, in its meaning formations. A ch- uh, what I love about children who play, and it's something that great psychoanalysts discovered, or actually not psychoanalysts, Roger Calois did a brilliant job figuring this out in the 20th century in his book on games. Anthony said, children, first of all, play is one of the only things that is instinctive and intuitive to a child. Going to bed on time, going to school, these are all forced. These are all authoritarian gestures, but play is something they do on their own. And even they realize very automatically that you need rules for a game to be fun. If it's just purely chaotic or anarchic, now sometimes it's fun spinning around in a circle until you're dizzy and you fall on the ground. But when they really want to play with one another, they create rules. But what's different about that versus human society, which is also just a big game that's forgotten that it's a game, you know, uh, it's a game of pretend as well, is that they are much more adept at quickly and instantaneously changing rules. The rules of the game can be reoriented very quickly. No child ever resents if you change the rules of a game suddenly in the middle because they don't think of winning the game. It's not instrumentalized. They are enjoying playing the game for the game's sake. And that's one thing. And the second thing is they will abandon any game to play any other game. Try this sometime. If you're playing with a child and you say halfway through, say, let's do something else. They immediately get up. They instantaneously want to play the other game. Just like an animal that you're playing with, anybody who comes to the door and rings the door is better than you. The new possibility is always more exciting than whatever they're doing. They've been real, and that's also the very logic of prophets, who are people who gave up their tribes, their sheep, their wives, their husbands, their whatever, to go up on the mountains and communicate with this new intimation that was emanating before them. They'll trade reality for the next thing anytime any day of the week. I think we need to get back to that. That's the orientation that uh, I think, and that's a different form of empathy as well. The curiosity and the fascination with the other who is arriving. Um, Let's, anyway, quick thing. Okay, let's take another question. So this is from, um, I don't know if it's Silak or Silak. Um, In David Lynch's Lost Highway, Fred Madison states, I like to remember things my own way, how I remembered them, not necessarily the way they happened. This is largely true for everyone to some degree. It can be argued that we all exist within our own constructive reality and it is only our collective consciousness which sets the baseline. Is fantasy therefore not our default state of being? Any takers? Yes, (laughs) the answer is yes. And that, the I mean, and again, that can be a wonderful thing or you could say that the very day you start believing in your own name uh, and answering to it is the day you are psychotic. There's something deeply psychotic about even pronouncing the very word I. Uh, And the idea that everybody talks to themselves is already a proof that we are in a schizophrenic state of self. Who are you talking to in there? There's many of us, right? And all that. So it's very complicated. But yes, even to exist as a knowing subject in the world requires a bizarre practice uh, and exercise of fantasy, which if you're a really cool, interesting person, I'm glad you did that. If you become, you know, uh, a destructive uh, sadist, then I'm, I'm, it's a shame that you went that route and pronounced your own subjectivity in the world and formed a fantasy route. But it really depends, again, on the style. I, I hate to put it, since Adam brought up Nietzsche, he's my absolute favorite philosopher, uh, I, it, it matters when he says style is such a crucial thing. How you carry yourself in the world is everything. So, so I'm a Derridean, so I'll, I'll agree with you on that one. There you go. <laughs> um, well, time for one last question, I think. So this is from um, Mariana. Has the panel any thoughts on Todorov's claim that psychoanalysis would eventually substitute the need for fantastic and within it, with it most likely also fantasy literature? <laughs> Sorry, not sure if I articulated that properly. 
I'm not familiar with that claim, so I don't really know. I don't really know what it means. Um, so I don't really know how to answer it. I don't see why that would happen. Also, I mean, one of the problems is that you know that we have all these concepts, right? Imagination, fantasy, the fantastic, and it, it's quite easy to kind of um, get confused. Um, the only, th well, I don't know. I don't know what the fantastic means there. But the only thing I have to say is that, um, as I said at some point during the um, during our Zoom, that that fantasy just is part of the psychic reality. You can't get rid of it. Um, even even working through this kind of fundamental fantasy doesn't mean that there that there will be no fantasy left. It's, it is an important, crucial part of it. Uh, it's just the way you relate to it that changes. If I, Danielle, if I could just say quickly to that as well, um, you know, if you look at Plato through Socrates, every time he says, look, we don't need stories and myths anymore and superstitions. We have reason. We have rationality. So let me explain. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> he tells a story. And so it's the same thing that Freud does as well. You know, I mean, yes, psychoanalysts may, psychoanalysis may be the ultimate new model of exploration for him. But then when he wants to talk about the uncanny, he goes back to a 19th century story to explain it. Or when he wants to talk about the death drive, he goes back to, you know, Moses. And he goes back to other places to talk about these things. So the story never goes away. The storytellers are never going to go extinct as far as I'm concerned. And even the, the most rationalistic, materialist ones in the world. Jason, I'm they sorry go to, the to cut you off. But we have run out of time. Um, thank you. Thanks very much to our speakers. Thank you all for coming. And one last thank you to my um, graduate student, Ashfin, who suggested this fantastic event. Thanks, everybody.